Hey guys, Project Zodiac here. This is part 3 of my X-Men film explanation series. Um, we're continuing explaining the retcons and continuities and inconsistencies of the X-Men film series and how they're not problematic, how they're not continuity errors, how they're not retcons, how they're not inconsistencies, how they're not contradictions, how they all actually work and tie into the series. Um, we're continuing with the characters. Um, this is now part three. Before I start, I do have to really state a disclaimer that all of these videos will have spoilers for every single X-Men movie. Every single one of them, including Dark Phoenix. So we're going to be talking about Mystique first. So Mystique is showing indifference to Professor Xavier in the original films, but in the prequel films, we see she cares for him. So we lots of people feel like that that's a, a continuity error or an inconsistency or a contradiction because again the prequel films were released after the the films the original films so why did they do that well after years of being how she is you know killing Trask and changing and being part of the brotherhood she doesn't really care for who she kills or not i mean she even tried to manipulate Beast a lot of the times in the prequel films. So we can assume that she doesn't want to do anything with Professor in the original, like, three X-Men movies. Um, but that she does remember a lot about her past and her past with him and their relationship. It's just that she doesn't really care too much about that. And even in 1973... Um, when Professor Xavier is trying to reach her, um, we can see that she just doesn't care about her relationship with him too, too much. She cares, but not how she used to. And she's more like, I just want to do what I want to do. And you get in my way kind of way. So that's why she behaves that way in the X-Men um, 1, 2, and 3 original trilogy. Um, the second one is that um, lots of people say that Mystique says in X-Men 1 that people like the senator are why she hated going to school as a child, but she lived a pampered life with Charles in the mansion. So that doesn't make sense for some people, but really she wasn't born in that house. She's not his blood sister. She's, she wasn't adopted when she was a baby, so she didn't grow up there as a baby she still had a childhood before she you know started to live with Charles and his family she didn't meet him until she was like eight or nine or around that age frame you know um, so we can clearly see that she ran away and you know she had a life before that so she could just be telling the senator at that time you know before she started living her life with um, Professor Xavier she hated going to school because people of how the senator thinks but even if that wasn't the case let's say she just didn't go to school very much or maybe she was homeschooled as a child before she moved in with the professor obviously the professor would have still at least like his family would have make, made her go to school or be homeschooled either way she would still be in school, either in a private, public, or home school. So she could still meet, you know, different kids if she went to, like, a school outside of being homeschooled. Or, you know, if she was homeschooled, her teachers, you know, all of these people. We know that clearly she had to go through school living her life with them. So... That still stays true. These people that she met, it's sort of, they're, they, they're sort of like the senator was, and she hated it. Um, but it wasn't as bad for her because she had Charles there with her, getting her through all of those things. So I don't really understand why some people do think that that's a continuity error or a contradiction. Um, but that's about it for Mystique. Let's head on to Sabretooth. So in the original X-Men movies, we see that Sabretooth and Wolverine are in the movie, but they don't know each other. Um, except Sabretooth didn't lose his memories in X-Men Origins, so how come he does not remember Wolverine at all? 
right, he didn't lose his memory in X-Men Origins, but remember, 15 years has passed from 1979 when um, they last saw each other. That's 15 years between the end of X-Men Origins Wolverine and the beginning of X-Men 1. We also know that Sabretooth wanted to go through experiments to put adamantium in him or to modify him, make him stronger. Um, So we can assume that in those 15 years that have passed, he does go through a few experiments and that's what changes his appearance and makes him lose his memories. Um, We see that similar with Lady Deathstrike. Um, She is being brain controlled, mind controlled by Stryker in it, but as her you know, the serum that he uses on her starts to fade off. She starts looking at herself and start thinking, like, what is going on? Like, what is up with my fingers? Like, why do they feel heavy? Why, you know, like, all of these things. So, we can assume that somehow, some way, through an experiment, Sabretooth ended up losing his memories. But maybe not entirely, because he does still get Wolverine's dog tags um, and he looks at it I don't think it was as a trophy kind of thing I think it was him in the back of his mind the back of his consciousness just something thinking like something about this is really familiar what I need to figure out what this is but not without like really asking too much kind of thing you know so I, I think he does sort of feel like he understands something about Wolverine that he isn't sure about, like that he's not recalling. So I think that's why he actually does take that um, dog tag. Moving on to the second one. So what happened to Sabretooth in the new timeline? Did Wolverine and Sabretooth um, meet each other again? Well, they are brothers. And in a deleted scene of the movie Logan, um, the short chubby kid, um, is playing with a Sabretooth action figure and a Wolverine action figure and he does ask Wolverine like oh was Sabretooth real and Wolverine does tell him yeah he was real um he he, we did a lot of bad things together we were in the same we were in a program similar to you and they made us do bad things um so You know, and this again is going back to the first part of this series, the timeline video, where I very quickly just said that um, in the 80s or late 70s, 80s, um, Wolverine and Sabretooth were still together as, you know, brothers in the Weapon X program. But this time they were both forced to do a lot of bad things as opposed to the in the original timeline where it was just Sabretooth who did those really bad things and Wolverine walked out. So again, Wolverine knows this because if you watch the second part, him and Professor Xavier are talking. So um, yes, yeah, so at some point in this new timeline, they probably did meet each other again. Um, so... I'm sure that he probably seeked him out. And I know that in the original drafts, they were going to have Wolverine go ask Sabretooth for some help. Um, And I think Sabretooth owned a bar or something in the original draft for Logan, but they didn't go with that. I'm not going to be including that in this just because that wasn't that wasn't made. That was just a draft. Um, I am including this deleted scene because similar to the Professor Xavier um, dinner scene with the farm in Logan where he because that scene was deleted where he's saying that Logan was married to Jean it's not really a altered scene it's just an extended scene it's still part of the movie that they decided to just cut out but it's in it's part of the deleted scenes package and it's not an alternate scene it's literally a continuation of the scene if you watch the movie and you watch that scene in the film cut and then just watch that um, the the extended dinner scene you can see exactly where they they cut off from that so it's not an alternate take it's it's just they just cut that out same thing for this one you can see where they cut it out if you watch it um, so 
I am including these two deleted scenes because they are part of that film. Um, and they're not an alternate take. They're continuing the, that same take. Um, so number three, why does Sabretooth look so different in X-Men 1 and, or in, and in Origins? Again, between 1979 and 1994, we can assume Sabretooth went through many experiments. It could have erased his memory to some extent. Um, it also most likely changed himself, um, like his appearance. So that basically explains that. And now moving on to Deadpool. So in Deadpool, in X-Men Origins, he already has his powers, yet it's 1973 through 1979, but he's in his 30s in 1973. But Deadpool in 2016, he does not have his powers and is still in his 30s. If they're both somewhat set in the same timeline, because again, Deadpool is a 30-something year old in 1973. Um, and that's after, um, the Vietnam War, um, scenes from Wolverine. That's when Wolverine is part of the Team X. How is he still a 30-year-old in Deadpool 1? If it's still in the same timeline, yet he doesn't have his powers. Um, well, that's simple because it's not the same Deadpool, <laughs> um, so we know that in 1973, Wade is in his 30s. The only power we see him have is superhuman reflexes. Um, but in 2016, he is still in his 30s and he is still a mercenary, but he does not have any abilities until he goes through that treatment, which gives him not just superhuman reflexes, but superhuman healing because he doesn't have his abilities until he goes through that process it can't be him it can't be a healing factor keeping him young it has to be a different person except that they're not that unrelated from one another these two are definitely just totally different characters but they are related Deadpool from 2016 could technically actually be um, Deadpool from 1973 and 1979's son because in Deadpool 2 Deadpool tells Vanessa that his dad walked out on him when he was young and he could be named after his father which would also explain why the two look alike and share the same name so basically that all lines up in a way because Wade from 1973 is a mercenary traveling the, the world doing all of these things. If he has a kid between 1975, 1979 in the new timeline, because again, the Deadpool films are set in the new timeline, then he probably um, left and never came back. Maybe he died. Um, and Deadpool 2, Deadpool and Deadpool 2 does tell Vanessa this, that his dad walked out on him when he was a kid. He wasn't joking in that scene because he kept telling Vanessa, I really just don't want to, I want to be there for my son because my dad wasn't there for me because they're planning to have a baby in Deadpool 2. So, you know, it's very possible that Deadpool in X-Men Origins is Wade's father and that they both have the same name. So moving on to Storm, Storm's accents throughout the films keep changing. Again, X-Men 1 and 2 aren't just a couple weeks from each other. They're months, like a couple months, as in like 9 to 11 months. So in that time frame, she just maybe started to lose her accent. Maybe her accent was heavier before we see her in X-Men 1. And as you know, these months keep passing by, and then it turns into a couple years. It just She just starts to lose her accent. Um, so that would explain why her accent does change can canonically in the movies, but we do know it was just the actress not wanting to do the accent anymore. So, but that's basically the, the best way to explain that because that also does happen in real life where you're in a place for so long, you might lose your, ac your original accent completely 
or you might lose it to some extent or you know you get like halfway between losing it or not losing it and getting a new accent um, your voice and your tone still stays the same but the accent completely changes sometimes so this is a realistic thing that can happen as well moving on to angel angel is a young adult in x-men 3 and sent to a rich family but Angel in the 80s in X-Men Apocalypse is around the same age and a cage failure. How can that happen? How are they the same age um, around the same time period, you know, like maybe a decade before um, X-Men 3 takes place? How is he still the same age? Like, was he burned earlier or something like that? Well, maybe, but I think the easiest explanation for that is that it's not the same character it's not the same angel character um it's probably a mutant with just the um, similar abilities we already have a, a female angel in x-men first class where she also has wings but hers are like very butterfly-ish kind of wings um as opposed to angel in x-men apocalypse and angel in um x-men 3 where it's like bird angel wings so it, it's easier to just assume that this is a different person, not the same character, just a person with the same abilities, uh, but totally different character. So Nightcrawler, if X-Men Days of Future Past changed the timeline, it makes the official games non-canon. So what did happen with Nightcrawler after X-Men 2? Well, the official games aren't canon anyway. It was just made to sort of bridge the gap between the, that and the next movie. And while it does explain what does happen to Nightcrawler, again, it's not really canon. So we can just assume that after the events of X-Men 2, Nightcrawler just wanted to go and do his own thing or travel, maybe look for a monastery and help other people. Um, but again, that's in the old timeline. In the new timeline... Well, he's part of the team. He joins the team in the 80s and he's still with them in the, in the 90s. Um, so, you know, he's still part of the team. He didn't lead the X-Men in the new timeline. So, again, in the old timeline, he just probably just wanted to travel on his own. In the new timeline, he's still part of the team. And what about Mystique and Azazel? Are they Nightcrawler's parents? Well, they could be. We do see Mystique join Azazel and the Brotherhood and all of that. And we do know that Nightcrawler takes attributes from both of them. It's never really explained, but most likely we can assume that he could be her son. Um, it would also explain why she looked, sought him out um, in X-Men Apocalypse. I mean, but at the same time, she doesn't show any motherly care for him she doesn't show any um motherly words or anything like that for him so it also shows that maybe they're not even related at all or you could argue that maybe she just doesn't care about having a kid but she still wants to make sure that he's okay so she's trying to take him away from you know that kind of fight fighting world and being um, basically imprisoned so you could argue that so I'm not going to say that yes they they are his parents but it could be a very big possibility and no Nightcrawler is not addressed at all in X-Men Dark Phoenix to be Mystique's son so we still do not have an actual confirmation about this but he he doesn't really act the way we would assume a son would normally act when his parent dies. So we can assume that if he is their son, he doesn't know or that he just isn't their son and he just isn't related to them at all. Now moving on to Emma Frost. I love this one as well. Um, Emma Frost is a teenager or a young adult in the 19th, in 1979 in X-Men Origins, but she's a full adult in the 60s during X-Men First Class. How does that work at all? Well, just like with Angel, we know that some people have similar abilities. 
Emma from the 1960s is not the same Emma from 1979. They share both the first name and very similar powers, but they're not the same people. Emma Frost is from the 60s, and other than her diamond skin, she also has telepathy. The Emma from 1979, she's Kayla's younger sister, and due to the last name, we know that this Emma is called um, is called Emma Silver Fox. This Emma does not show any sign of telepathy at all, and we only see her use her diamond skin. So again, same first name, similar abilities, but not the same character at all. Trask. Trask's skin color and height is totally different in X-Men Days of Future Past um, compared to how it is in X-Men 3. So this has to be a really big contradiction, right? Except it's not. Bolivar Trask in 1973 is not the same as in X-Men 3. Bolivar Trask dies in 1973 in the original timeline. The Trask we see in X-Men 3 only shares his the same last name. We're never given an official first name from him. And trust me, I looked up at the IMDb page, I looked up on the X-Men Wiki, I looked up on uh, Wikipedia, I looked everywhere. Even on the credits for X-Men 3, all we get for this Trask is Senator Trask. So again, they're two different people, they just share the same last name, but they're not the same Trask. Jubilee. Well, Jubilee is a teenager young adult in the original trilogy, yet she's the same age in the 80s as Scott and Jane and Nightcrawler are during the 80s. So how is she that, you know, like a, a teenager or an almost a young adult in the 80s, but in the 90s, she's in the original timeline, she's that same age, you know, that's a decade difference. Well... So th this one's a little bit more tricky, but it is easy enough to understand. If she's around 15 or 16 in, in X-Men 1, which takes place in 1994, then she, that means she would have been born in 19, between 1978 and 1979 in the original timeline. That would make her f between 4 and 5 years old in 1983 in the original timeline. But, you know... If she was somehow born earlier in the new timeline because of the events that Wolverine changed starting from 1973, so let's say she was born in 1973 or 1974 in the new timeline, she would still only be around 10 years old by 1983, but she's clearly not 10 years old. She's anywhere between 16 to 18 um, years old in 1983 in the new timeline so that means that the jubilee in the new timeline might not really be jubilee from the original trilogy this could be her mother who in the original timeline could have ended up being a teen mom or it could just be an older sister beast so we see beast as a human in x-men 2 and as a beast in x-men 3 and when he goes to meet Leech in X-Men 3, he sees his hand for the first time in what seems like forever, and he's astonished and amazed by Leech's gift. So why did he act like he hasn't seen his skin in such a long time when he has a serum, that serum that he created in the, in the 60s? Well, again, X-Men 2 and X-Men 3 take place a year or two from each other. Between then, Beast probably stopped using his serum entirely. Also, his serum was made to alter just appearances, not abilities, but we do see that it does stop the ability, but the serum does wear off. And the person has to take it again. They thought that Leech's power fully removes the abilities, but we see that it's a similar case to Beast's serum, where it does wear off eventually and the powers to return. So Beast is acting that way because it has been around maybe a year or two that he's seen his own like human skin, you know, because he stopped using the serum for whatever reason. 
And again, he also acts like that because everybody is thinking that Leech's powers are indefinite. That, you know, that this cure will keep, will stay forever, but it does wear off as well and they would need to take it again. So that explains why he was acting that way, why he acts like he hasn't seen his skin, you know, his real skin in a very long time. Um, it's because he probably just stopped taking his serum and it will also explain why he was you know, a human rather than a beast in X-Men 2. So why does Beast look different every single time that we see him in the movies? Well, his first serum enhanced the mutant gene and turned him into like, almost like a cat-like beast thing. Um, it, and he says it in X-Men First Class, it accelerated his mutant genes to transform how he would eventually become. You know, maybe in decades or maybe, you know, that's the max reach of his mutation or something like that. Somehow, someway, that's a form that he would have reached anyway throughout time. So he probably altered his serum to make it more stable so it, it makes him still have his abilities but not become a full beast appearance, like a full animal-like appearance, just... Still with the human face, but still with, like, the blue fur. Like, maybe that was as much as his serum could allow him to um, to restabilize. So he isn't able to revert back to being just a full human without a, um, a serum. And this serum now makes his default appearance that way. It's like between a human and a beast. Because he was able to stabilize his mutation a little bit, but not enough to just make him full human again without continuously taking the serum like he does because he does explain this in um, X-Men Days of Future Past. How can Beast change by will now he, he couldn't before in, in X-Men Dark Phoenix? Well, he can't change by will at all. He stated in the other films that his appearance is now controlled by his emotions due to the amount of the serum he takes He's able to control his emotions at any time to force an, um, a, an appearance change. Um, but his normal default form is still the beast form, not the human form. So we even see him change his appearance at will during Days of Future Past a couple of times. Um, so that's how he's actually able to just turn into beast at, at will. Um, and yeah, sorry, moving on, Quicksilver, so this is the only one for Quicksilver, um, so Quicksilver never really tells Magneto he's his son, no, he doesn't on screen, but maybe he does between 1983 and 1992, or after 1992, or maybe he just decides not to tell Magneto at, at all, since he couldn't really have that courage, to tell Magneto in 1983, but we do know that he definitely is Magneto's son, because in Days of Future Past, um, Quicksilver's mom tells him, um, you know, the, the language that she uses, I can't remember the exact words right now, um, but what she's saying basically implies that yes, Magneto really is um, Quicksilver's father, as like 100% confirmed. So we don't know if Magneto knows or if he will ever know, but we as the audience, we do know that Quicksilver is 100% confirmed to be Magneto's son in the X-Men film universe. So that's it for this video. Um, it was a little bit longer than the other ones, I think. So I'm sorry about that. But I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, we're going to continue with... Um, the the red cons and continuity errors in part four and that's gonna finish up the characters and it's gonna also talk about the world red cons and continuity errors so i hope you guys stay tuned for that rate come subscribe and thank you guys so much